Okay, right. So welcome back to the, uh, I guess, our penultimate session. And as I promised earlier during my talk, we will now have the incomparable Scott Gowdy tell us about astrometry with Roman. All right, thanks, Aki. Um, yeah, I was asked to talk about using astrometry with the Roman Space Telescope to uh, detect and characterize exoplanetary systems. And so um, I'll just start off. Um, so first, let me just talk a little bit about Roman for those of you that aren't familiar with it. Um, it's, ne it's NASA's next flagship mission uh, following on JWST. Uh, Roman is uh, basically the same aperture as Hubble. It's about 2.4 meter, although the effective aperture is smaller because there's some obscurations. Um, it has a field of view of 0.281 square degrees. And so that's actually what makes it unique from Hubble is it has a much larger field of view, instantaneous field of view. Uh, wavelength range is sort of the mid-optical op to, to the near-infrared, 0.5 to 2 microns. That's the wide field instrument. Uh, the full width half max of one micron is diffraction limited at 0.1 arc seconds. Pixel size is, is such that the, the PSF is, is undersampled at one, uh, one micron. The launch time is, oops, I dropped a six there. <laughs> 2026 or 2027, or more realistically 2027. Nominal lifetime is five years, but of course, uh, as mo with most NASA, missions of this class, it'll be uh, hopefully last longer than that, 10 years or more. And it will be located at L2, which is nice because uh, you can get unobstructed views of objects um, without worrying about you know, the moon or the earth getting in the way. Uh, and it's a nice quiet environment out there. So uh, the wide field instrument, um, oh, sorry. And I, I didn't talk about the instruments. So there's two instruments. There's the wide field instrument, uh, which is uh, exactly what it says. It's just a wide field Im imager with uh, H4R, 18 H4RG detectors, so about 300 million pixels. Um, and like I said, the instantaneous square, uh, field of view is about 0.28 square degrees or about 100 times the ACS on Hubble. Um, and there are seven filters, which I'll, I'll, I'll go through here in a second, including and a grism and a prism to do low resolution uh, spectroscopy. There's also a CGI instrument. Uh, this is uh, gonna operate in the visible. Uh, this is a, a test bed, uh, test tech, demo uh, instrument designed to, uh, to test active wavefront control and correction uh, using a chronograph in space. And so it is a important milestone in, uh, in the next, the steps to uh, the next great mission after Roman, which was Iru, which Aki just told you about. So this is a very important instrument. Um, it will do some science as well, but the main driver is to just do this, this demonstration of coronography, uh, active coronography in space. Um, and uh, there will be several main surveys as currently envisioned. There's going to be a high latitude survey that does images and imaging and spectroscopy over a thousand square degrees at high latitude uh, to do cosmology, baryon acoustic oscillations, weak lensing, and supernova observations. Um, and then, uh, sorry, baryon acoustic oscillations and, and uh, weak lensing. And then there's going to be supernova and microlensing surveys of smaller fields of view, but with repeated, uh, with repeated observations to monitor, um, to look for supernova and microlensing events, which I'll talk about here in a second. And then again, there's a, gonna be, uh, I think it's roughly currently envisioned six months uh, on the coronagraph uh, for the tech demonstration uh, observations, but uh, in principle, there could be more assuming it works uh, as, as planned or even better. Uh, these are the seven filters. Uh, the filters, the seven roughly standard filters. Uh, and then there's a wide F146 filter, it's called. This goes from one to two microns. That's for the microlensing survey where we just want to get as many photons as possible. Um, and then there's a grism and a prism as well for the, um, for the redshift surveys and, uh, and supernova identification. Okay, so this shows the field of view on the sky uh, of each of the 18 uh, H4RG detectors compared to the fields of view of ACS, WFPIC3, and NIRCAN. Uh, and you can see that it's uh, quite a bit larger, about 100 times the field of view, roughly the, uh, the same uh, solid angle on the sky as the full moon. Uh, and uh, these detectors are all in hand. Uh, the flight uh, detectors have been picked. They've been extremely well characterized after you know, many, many months of, of detailed study. Uh, and they're all you know, essentially perfect detectors that pass the, uh, all the, the design specs. So we're ready to go as far as the detectors are concerned. In terms of the astrometric accuracy, um, so in general, there's the, this rule of thumb that we know that the uh, astrom if you want to do astrometry on an image, uh, you can you can uh, centroid that image in each of the two uh, components, 
to roughly uh, the full width half maximum of the image divided by the signal's noise. And there's factors of order unity in front of that, depending on the exact shape of your PSF. Um, so uh, you can get a 1% uh, photometric measurement or signal to noise of, um, of a, of a 10,000 photometric measurement, oh, sorry, if it's signal noise of 100 uh, photometric measurement in about one minute on an, uh, a 21 21.15, uh, magnitude star in the wide microlensing filter. Uh, and so that would give you one milli arc second per axis per exposure uh, with, with that kind of, um, that kind of uh, signal to noise. Uh, and of course, you know, it changes as a function of the magnitude and your exposure time as in the usual way. Uh, in principle, you can do better than this by doing root N of many observations, or as I'll talk about later, you can do drift scanning uh, or spatial scanning, uh, where you actually let the image of, the, of your target move along the detector and spreading the light over many pixels. Um, and you can also use diffraction spikes from the very bright stars uh, to centroid on those to do astrometry on, uh, of stars. And that's similar to the, the you've heard talks earlier today on this. Um, and since the diffraction spikes are very long uh, and uh, cover most of the wide field instrument for the very brightest stars, uh, but are very narrow, you can do very, very precise one dimensional uh, astrometry on those diffraction spikes. Um, now, in general, all of these uh, all of these precisions require um, to get the accuracy and the precision. You really have to um, characterize your detector exquisitely. Not so much for the for the one milli arc second, which is only you know a factor of ten to the minus two of a pixel. But when you're starting to talk about ten to the minus four of a pixel, which is roughly ten micro arc seconds, then you know you really have to worry about things like uh, the inter and intra pixel variations um, and all sorts of uh, effects, detector effects that are that are present in the H4RGs at relatively low levels, but important when you start talking about those kinds of precisions and accuracies. So this is a table from a, a review. If you're really interested in doing astrometry with Roman, you should you should have a look at this review by led by Robin Sanderson. Um, basically, it summarizes the various levels of astrometric precision that we can expect. So just direct imaging mode, uh, you know, exposing to basically the full well of the of the of the pixel, um, you can expect sort of one point one. Um, uh, Sorry, you can expect sort of one milli arc second astrometric precision along each axis. If you had 100 exposures for, per field and you can control your systematics, you can get down to 0.1 milli arc seconds. Um, obviously, you do better with proper motions because uh, you know you, you have the time uh, and the lever of the, the long time baseline. So we can expect sort of 25 micro arc second precision per year. Um, and then the microlensing survey itself per image will also be one milli arc second. But the, there's going to be roughly 40,000 images of each of this each of the 100 million stars in the uh, in the survey area for microlensing. And so if you can actually take advantage of that full root end, which is a factor of 200 or so, you can in principle get down to three or 10 micro arc seconds. Now that's, you know, like I said, that's 10 to the minus four or less of a pixel. So you really have to worry a lot about these detector effects. Um, and extrapolating from results from Hubble, uh, you can probably do 10 micro arc second precision uh, by doing the spatial scanning, by spreading the light over the pixels as the telescope drifts during the exposure. Um, and, uh, and then if you center on diffraction spikes, you can also probably get about 10 micro arc second growth uh, using the wide field images of very, very bright stars. Okay, so uh, what are the, so given this, these astrometric precision in the various regimes, what are the science applications of this in terms of exoplanets? So let me first just talk about the Roman bulge time domain spray here. The astrometric, uh, um, uh, the, the what astro astrometry is going to give us is not um, really about detecting planets, but about characterizing the host stars and therefore characterizing the planets that are detected with microlensing. So the galactic bulge time domain survey is generally the general term for the survey towards the center of our galaxy, uh, whose primary goal uh, or was one of the main goals is, is to do a microlensing survey of cold exoplanets, but also we'll do a lot of other science as well. Uh, that is that is also quite important. Um, so uh, this is an astrometry conference, so I sort of have to introduce microlensing. Basically, uh, in, for microlensing, for the case of Roman, we're staring at a star in the galactic bulge. Uh, if you stare at that star long enough, then some inner uh, in star in the foreground will pass very close to your line of sight to that background star, uh, very close being about a milli arc second um, or less. Uh, when that happens, the foreground star's gravity will bend the light from the background star and actually split it into two images, as you can see here in this cartoon or this animation. 
Uh, and uh, and those two images are are sort of are unresolved because they're separated by roughly the uh, the the Einstein ring radius, which is about a milli arc second. Um, but um, uh, but uh, the, the background star is actually brightened, so you get a magnification. And then if you have a planet that is in, happens to be in the path of one of these images created by its host star, a planet around the foreground star, then as that planet sort of intercepts the path of the, those images, you'll get an additional little brightening there. You can see right here, additional brightening, and that's the signature of a planetary perturbation. So that's how you detect planets. And because those images are located at roughly uh, 5 AU for a solar type star about halfway between us and the galactic bulge or about 3 AU for an M dwarf, um, you're probing the outer regions of planetary systems uh, that you can't really uh, do with, uh, with greater velocities or astrometry or transits, at least for the low mass planets that, that Roman will be sensitive to. So uh, the great thing, you know, there are lots of great things about microlensing. You can detect planets beyond the snow line where we think most planets will likely form. Uh, very low mass planets uh, down to roughly 10% the mass of Mars or roughly the mass of Ganymede. Uh, you can detect long period and even free floating planets because you can, a planet acts like a lens by itself, even if it's not bound to a host star. Uh, basically, you're looking for planets around anything that happens to pass along your line of sight to the background star. So that can be brown dwarfs or solar mass stars in the bulge um, or, or, our, uh, or even stellar remnants. And in fact, one microlensing planet has already been discovered around a white dwarf uh, at relatively large separations. The typical mass is maybe about 0.5 solar masses. Uh, and you're sensitive to planets orbiting stars all along your line of sight. Uh, and solar system analogs and moons of giant and terrestrial planets. So that's all great. The, one of the drawbacks of microlensing, though, is that the host stars are generally faint, um, and you don't measure the mass in general from the, the, the sort of bulk observables of a microlensing event. So you don't measure the mass of the star or the planet, you just measure the mass ratio. Um, so, you know, it was generally thought when microlensing surveys were first developed that you really wouldn't learn very much about the, the planetary system itself. It really just is a purpose of doing demographics of cold planets. That turns out to be overly pessimistic. Uh, in fact, we have been able to measure the flux of a significant fraction of the lens stars for the planets that we've discovered from the ground in microlensing. And uh, by measuring the lens flux and uh, combining some additional higher order information, we can actually measure, we can actually estimate the lens mass itself. Um, and so that gives us the mass of the host star. And then from the mass ratio from the light curve, we get the mass of the planet. And we can usually measure those masses to roughly 10% accuracy. Um, and they're not direct geometrical mass measurements, obviously, they're, they're mass measurements um, based on the light. Uh, but, you know, given the 10% accuracy we can get, um, that's not too sensitive to things like differences in metallicity and things like that. Um, and I'll, actually, I'll talk about ways in which we can measure the metallicity in principle of the lens star, some of the lens stars of, uh, of hosts detected um, by Roman. So uh, in terms of what you can get from a microlensing survey, this has been simulated by Matthew Penny and also Samson Johnson at Ohio State. Um, and you know the basic idea is the nominal survey design is you have seven fields <coughs> that you point to and you cycle through those fields every 15 minutes. Um, and each of those fields you simulate a scene based on uh, a model of the galaxy and the distribution of st stars in the galaxy. Um, then you inject microlensing events into that scene, and then you inject planets into those microlensing events, and you see if you can detect those planetary perturbations. And here's an example of a planetary perturbation that's easily detected uh, at a very high signal to noise, and this is, happens to be the mass of roughly the mass of Ganymede or twice the mass of the moon. Uh, so you can see these signals are very, very significant, not like um, like the sort of marginal signals you see in some of the transit detections. And furthermore, the, the false positive rate of of, of photometric deviations of this magnitude around solar type stars, old solar type stars in the bulge is basically nothing. Uh, my, uh, solar type stars by and large, old solar type stars by and large don't vary at the more than millimagnitude level, except with some rare exceptions. So um, just to give you a sense of the number of stars we'll be looking at, this is one, uh, this is a simulated image towards the galactic bulge taken with Roman. Uh, using one of these realistic galactic models. This is 0.1% of the entire survey area of the Roman Galactic Bulge Microlensing Survey or Time Domain Survey, just to give you a sense of how many stars are going to be involved. And we need those number of stars because microlensing events are, themselves are quite rare. Uh, so if we want to get a large sample of them and a large sample of planets, we need to look at a lot of stars continuously. And that's where Roman uh, capabilities are so uh, crucial. Okay, so the yields are you know, made up, but we think 
uh, thousands of planets will detect uh, with masses from, you know, like I said, all the way down to the mass of Ganymede, up to super Jupiters and brown dwarfs, et cetera, over a relatively large range of semi-major axis, the larger range for higher mass planets, obviously, um, and then of course, free floating planets as well. So this is gonna be a, you know, a comparable data set to what we see in, in Kepler in terms of statistical precision, uh, but very complementary. And so, you know, combining Kepler and Roman, we get a complete census of exoplanets uh, with masses or radii greater than that of Earth uh, and separations from zero to infinity, essentially. So we would like to be able to measure know more about the host stars, uh, and that's where astrometry comes in. The host stars and actually the source stars, which gives us additional leverage that enables us to learn more about the host stars. Um, and so, uh, so that's where astrometry comes in. I just want to br briefly mention before I get to that, though, you can also detect, you also detect about 100,000 transiting planets towards the galactic bulge, as shown by uh, Montet et al. in 2017, uh, just because you're looking at so many stars with such a re high, reasonably high photometric precision and a high cadence. Um, and you'll get things down to the mass of roughly twice that of Earth. Now, you know, false positives here are a huge concern for this, this, um, this survey in particular because the stars themselves are going to be quite far away and faint, so it's going to be hard to do like high resolution spectroscopy on most of those. But if we could actually measure the parallaxes of a lot of these stars where we see a, a photometric dips due to transiting companions, then we can uh, break some degeneracies and enable us to estimate the radius of that host star and therefore the radius of the planet, and then distinguish at least for low mass planets between uh, something that's a diluted um, kind of system or, uh, or a, uh, actually a small planet. Um, and so uh, measuring parallaxes is tough. The parallax of a star in the galactic bulge is about 125 micro arc seconds. But as I said, if you can actually take advantage of the 44,000 images we get of every star, each with one milli arc second astrometric precision, you should be able to measure that parallax to 10 sigma. Um, so 10% uh, parallax measurement, and that really will help break degeneracies in the in uh, figuring out the the hosts of these uh, <coughs> transiting systems and also microlensing events as well. Um, so Roman will measure the parallaxes to the source stars of planetary microlensing events and the host stars of transiting companions. Um, it'll also measure the astrometric microlensing deflection. So this I think was maybe briefly mentioned earlier in this in this um, in this workshop. But basically, you know, you have two images formed by the host star. Those two images have variable magnifications and are um, spatially separated from each other. Um, but you can't resolve the two images, but the centroid of those two images on the sky moves as a function of time as the magnification of the two images moves. And the amount that it moved, that centroid moves is directly proportional to the Einstein ring of the host star. And therefore, you can use that to break degeneracies and actually measure the mass of the individual host stars, at least the more massive ones, of planets detected by microlensing events. And this is, is a geometric measurement of the mass, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so this was recently done for the first time towards the galactic bulge for a black hole candidate. And so it turns out to be an isolated black hole uh, and using astrometry from Hubble Space Telescope, which is obviously less precise, but even more importantly, has much lower cadence. So that's the image I'm showing here on the right. Uh, this is from a recent paper by Rose et al., but there's two other papers that are the discovery papers that, that talk about this, including Sahu et al. and Lam et al. I encourage you to go look at those two papers. And so they were able to measure this astrometric reflection and show that this, this lens was an isolated uh, black hole, uh, which is the first such isolated black hole ever detected, which is pretty exciting. Um, but the same principle applies to uh, Roman, but because we have more data points and better precision, we can do this all the way down to solar uh, hosts and maybe even half solar mass hosts if they're in the foreground. Uh, so that'll enable us to characterize the planetary systems detected by microlensing much better. Um, and I just want to throw this out. I have an undergraduate working on a project who's shown that at least for the brighter host stars of microlensing events detected with Roman, um, we'll actually be able to use JWST, assuming we can get the time, and JWST is still working, which it should be, um, then uh, we, can, we can actually get slow sort of R of a thousand spectra in the near infrared of, of a significant fraction of the host stars and use that to measure the effect of temperature and metallicity of those host stars. And then you can start looking at things like the demographics as a function of host star mass and metallicity as well. Uh, but that's sort of tangential to this talk. All right, so now I wanna just talk about actually measuring, detecting exoplanets with astrometry with Roman. 
And so um, you can write down uh, the astromet the signal to noise of let's say you have n astrometric measurements, uh, each with you know two D astrometric measurements. Uh, so this is either because you're just centroiding images on uh, on your detector, or uh, you have to get you know you're doing one dimensional astrometry but at two different angles. Um, so but again n uniform astrometric uniformly sampled over the the period of the planet. Uh, 2D astrometric measurements, each with a precision sigma. Uh, you know, this is an, obviously an oversimplification. Um, then you can write down what the signal to noise is as a function of the semi-major axis of the of the orbit, the distance, the planet mass, the host star mass, and even an analytic relation between that and the inclination, eccentricity, and argument of periastron. Again, assuming uniform dense sampling. Uh, so this is a um, so you can use this as a good heuristic. To say can we detect planets or not? One important thing to note with a and I don't I'm sure this has been mentioned, but I I, I missed it. I think um, it's very hard to detect planets with astrometry that have periods significantly greater than the duration of your survey because those just cause linear trends in the host star and those linear trends can get fit out for the proper motion. So you really have to measure an acceleration uh, in order to detect, and that's uh, a companion. And that's different from radial velocity where we expect expect the the, the you know the acceleration of the star to be low uh, and so if you see a trend in your rate of velocity it, it signifies it's a distant companion although you don't know what to measure you only have a combination of the mass and the period okay so you can figure out what the signal to noise is for a given astrometric precision and number of data points if you had 50 data points each with 10 a micro arc second astrometric precision you could detect a 10 earth mass planet with a period of 10 years around a solar type star with a signal to noise of 20 and that would give you about a 5% mass measurement. Uh, so that's that's very powerful. Again, this is a very highly simplified treatment. It ignores multiple planet systems and, and other things and it, irregular sampling and different uncertainties. And so again, this is just be used as a heuristic. Um, but it gives you a sense of if you can get down to this 10 micro arc seconds with a reasonable number of data points, you can actually start to probe interesting regions of parameter space in terms of mass and semi-major axis that are difficult to probe any other way around relatively bright nearby stars, which is very exciting. So, um, and it's complementary to radio velocity because obviously your, your, your um, sensitivity increases with semi-major axis, at least up until the, the duration of your survey. So there's two ways to think about getting kind of 10 micro arc second precision with astrometry. One is to just use diffraction spikes from really bright stars that are just maybe just off of your wide field instrument chip. Those diffraction spikes will spread over most of the most of the detectors, and then you can cent centroid those very precisely along one axis. And so this was a, a work by Melchior et al. did a, a, a sort of interesting uh, back of the envelope uh, estimate of how well you could do, um, assuming you control systematics. And they argue that you can get 10 micro arc second one dimensional astrometric precision with a single 100 expo second exposure of a very bright R6 star. Um, uh, using this technique. And that corresponds to a 10 to the minus four of a pixel, which means you need explicit control of systematics, which means you need to characterize your detector very well. But that is very actually quite powerful and it's only a hundred seconds. So, um, so you know, that's that's a back of the envelope, you know, theoretical calculation, but work from uh, Hubble actually back, backs this up um, uh, and uh, we don't have time to go into it. Anyway, so with spatial scanning is the other way, you just uh, let the, the, the star move along a column as as the um, with the telescope moving as you're exposing, and then you can spread that light over many pixels. Reduces systematics, also enables you to look brighter stars before saturation, so you get effectively more photons. And so, work from HST shows that you can get to sort of 20 or 40 mi uh, mi uh, micro arc seconds using this technique. Um, and then with wide field in instrument, you expect to do better because you have a bigger detector and you have more trails, longer trails that you can spread your light over. Um, and then finally, if you can combine with Di Gaia, you can actually extend the baseline of your survey itself. I don't have time to go into that. Um, so uh, Melchior showed that with this kind of sensitivity, you can get down to the habitable zones of some nearby stars, a couple dozen, um, at, uh, around some M stars and some solar mass stars as well. Um, and of course, you can also then look for companions to some of the bright stars that are going to be targeted by Iruv as well. You might not be able to get down to Earth in the habitable zone using Roman, but you can certainly vet, uh, look for super Earths in the habitable zone, at least some of the targets, which I think is a super powerful application of Roman in preparation for the Iruv uh, mission. All right, and with that, I'll just summarize and I'll just take questions.
Well, I'll just throw out my summary and take questions. Should I be looking at this? I should be looking at um, Hi, Scott. Yeah. Um, actually, so I'll read out the first question from the Slack, which was actually mine. Okay. So, um, so uh, would you uh, be so good as to summarize what Roman will do to better constrain ADA sub Earth? And oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and um, please, just, hey. just as a favor to me, please just call it Luvex while I can hear you, not your roof. <laughs> Um, I, I've sort of slowly, you know, I've slowly turned to the dark side. Um, okay, uh, Luvex. Uh, so, okay, Ada Earth. So uh, it's probably easier to just go back to this plot, um, the penny plot. Oops. All right, so here's the, here's the plot of sensitivity of Roman as a function of semi-major axis. You can see that, that Venus and Earth are, you know, within the sensitivity limit, but just barely of Roman. Uh, this should sound familiar because it's uh, it's sort of the analogous situation to Kepler, where uh, Venus and Earth are kind of just outside of the sensitivity region of of Kepler. So um, if you do a prediction of the number of you know, assuming our current estimates of Eta Earth of about twenty five percent, and uh, and then fold that through with the detection sensitivity of Roman, you can uh, you we can expect to detect a handful of Earth analogs around solar type stars. So not a lot. But um, but by extrapolating from higher mass stars in the higher mass planets in the habitable zone, or Earth ma mass planets outside of the habitable zone, you can um, extrapolate into the habitable zone and get a better measurement, which is exactly what, what Kepler did, except coming from the other side uh, and also doing it in radius, not mass. And so, if you can guess a mass radius relationship of things in the habitable zone, then you could actually interpolate between Kepler and Roman. And get a better estimate of Ada Earth, and I, I don't see this as really improving the accuracy with which we know Ada Earth, but just giving us a kind of a sanity check that what we're getting out of Roman, or sorry, or Kepler, is basically correct, um, and that's all we need in order to plan for Lubex. We don't need to know Ada Earth to one percent. In fact, it's pointless to know Ada Earth to one percent because the Poisson fluctuations in the Lubex sample are going to be small, larger than that. Um, so it would just provide a nice sanity check, in my opinion, for our current estimates of Ada Earth. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that bottom line for sure. But um, there's some, some you know, thought that maybe the extrapolations moving from the inside out lately was maybe overestimating Ada sub Earth, which we should talk about more some other time. Right. Yes, that is that is a current concern. I think a lot of people have. Okay, um, I guess I'll read some of the Slack questions here for you. Um, okay, I'm, not, I'm not sure I completely understand this one, but what is your opinion of using Roman microlensing survey to observe the exoplanets orbiting the host stars in microlensing events? Um, I'm not, do you understand what that is about? I don't understand what that means. <laughs> okay, so, I guess I'll have to ask Fatima if you could try to clarify okay. that, re clarify that one in the Slack. Um, that would be helpful. Um, okay, so Carl Stapelfeld, for Roman to make direct parallax determinations to the lensing stars, it would need to conduct microlensing campaigns six months apart instead of every year as done from the ground. Is that straightforward slash part of the current plan? Uh, that's a great question, Carl. And indeed, uh, the, two, um, the two windows, 72 day windows that Roman will be able to observe the galactic bulge are in the spring and then the fall. Uh, and northern spring and northern fall, um, and vice versa for the southern hemisphere. So uh, yes, in fact, we will be separated by six months. Uh, and so we are we are planning, we are hoping to plan a survey strategy such that um, the the six or seven seasons that we observe the galactic bulge, we do so in pairs of two uh, on either side. Uh, so the, the ideal strategy would be sort of like two and two for the first four seasons, and then another two at the last, last season of the five-year mission. Uh, that gives us the biggest handle on proper motions as well. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, there are a few more questions in the Slack. Can, if you could uh, sure. go there and just answer them by typing, that would be appreciated. Sounds good. Okay. Thank, thank you. you.